According to Benjamin Bergen, who, who teaches classes in profanity at the University of California, profane words fit into four taboo categories, words related to sex, bodily functions, religion, and also words describing groups of people. With this in mind, it's easy to see why profanity isn't really very appropriate for most classrooms. In a 1998 national survey, 40% of students reported that the misbehavior of other students, such as talking about things not related to the curriculum or skills, like bodily functions, sex, and religion, interfered with their school performance. And 4% of students ages 12 through 18 reported feeling victimized, which could include overhearing or being referred to by a negative label during the past six months. Even if the connection is unintentional, by using profanity, especially profanity related to groups of people, you risk being labeled as prejudiced, even if you self-identify as part of that group. In a study referenced by Kara Saval, high school students who believe their peers are prejudiced report higher levels of emotional distress and higher levels of racial tensions can then create hostile school environments. And once you leave school, most of us will be entering work environments where email um, is monitored and conversations may be surveilled. Even outside of work, there are laws in place that penalize offensive language, labeling much of it sexual harassment and discrimination. Because profanity, according to Katie Steinmetz, a correspondent with Time Magazine, can become so deeply ingrained it is a physical act, we need to do everything we can now to break the habit. So why do people use profanity in the first place? You may not know this, but using profanity can have some benefits, primarily for the user. Steinmetz notes that researchers found people could withstand more physical discomfort if they repeated a swear word, but she cautions that constant use of profanity can habituate. In other words, the words are gonna lose their oomph. So if this is why you're using profanity and a word slips out, apologize and try to find a more permanent way to alleviate your physical discomfort and pain. Profanity can be a way to signal that we belong to a certain social group. It can be humorous, and it can give us a feeling of release from social constraints or rules. Timothy J. and Kristen Janschwitz in The Science of Swearing note that as we mature, most of us develop a contextually bound swearing etiquette. In other words, an awareness that it's okay to swear when we know our listeners are all okay with it at, for example, a stand-up comedian's performance or with a group of close friends watching a sports game. But it's not okay in mixed company or in controlled environments like work and school. Profanity can also give us a sense of power and control over a bad situation. It can be a type of nonviolent retribution. If you're in this type of situation and are using profanity as a defense mechanism or as an attack, you could be harming those around you. Your self-expression could be stressful and hostile to other people, something that shouldn't be tolerated at school. So how do we solve profanity that's being used as an act of aggression or profanity that's just prolific? In other words, someone who's using profanity all the time. Kara Saval, a social science researcher, advocates for restorative justice, including repairing the harm and some form of community participation in disciplinary procedures. So in other words, we need to get the person who's using profanity and the people that are being affected by the profanity together to really emphasize that contextually bound swearing etiquette. In other words, where is it okay to swear, when is it okay to swear, and how much swearing is okay um, in, in a controlled environment if, if the environment, unlike school and work, doesn't kind of define those things um, for us.